Hey y'all, before I let you get to this week's episode, I wanted to let you know about something new and exciting that we are doing here at Bodice Tiplers. Um, we're going to do a big fundraiser for RAIN, which is the Rape, Abuse, and Incest National Network. It's the nation's largest anti-sexual violence organization. So if you're feeling guilty about having read some of these really rapey books, um, we're asking you to give money. And we don't get anything for this. We just want to like make the world a better place. Um, if you give um, using our link b before March 1st, uh, one of you will be randomly selected to get a box full of all the paperbacks that we have read um, and also one of our cool bodice tiplers tote bags. Uh, if you collectively raise $500, we will release our glamour shots. This is not a drill. We're really going to do this. These are authentic early 90s, weirdly whorish very alarmingly young girl pictures that both of us had our parents do for us because they loved us very much and they are bazonkers. You are going to want to see these so you had better better dig deep and Courtney thinks you won't give $500 so we need to prove Courtney wrong. Um, if you give uh, we will we'll have a link on our website bodicetiplers.com on Facebook on Twitter everywhere that we are socially um, but you can go directly. It's fundraise.rain with two N's dot org slash bodice tipplers. Um, and we'll see that link everywhere and go and donate. So donate before March 1st if you want to um, be entered into our little prize drawing. Um, and 500 bucks total uh, if you want to see our glamour shots. Thank you. Hey y'all, and welcome to Bodice Tipplers. I'm Sarah. And I'm Courtney. And this is the podcast where we read the uh, romance novels we used to steal off of our grandmother's nightstands, and then we drink about it. Yes. So, today we're going to be talking about, this is the first in kind of a series that we're doing, a series being two, <laughs> of books that we read and remembered reading when we were younger. So, actual ones. Like, we're talking, uh, we talk more about, like, kind of the class of romance yeah. novels. But now these we actually read. These fucked us up as children, and we're going to share that with you. And the great thing is, we got a message from Twitter, and our person doesn't want their name to be named. So, this is the message that we got, and it's amazing. And again, keep messages coming, because... I feel like Tinkerbell, like, you know, she needs applause to live. I need comments. I and need if you to don't know. want to do it on social media, it is bodicetipplers at gmail.com. And you can also just message us if you don't want us to read it online, by the way, out, out yeah. loud. We, and just tell us that. It's fine. So we got this message. It says, love the podcast. Thank you. <laughs> this episode in particular, and this episode in referring to is Captive Passions. This episode in particular reminded me of the time I borrowed Sea Star by Pamela Jekyll, written in 1983, from a friend's mom. I really liked pirates and had run out of books at the library about Anne Bonny. It wasn't exactly what I was expecting. 13-year-old me had never seen a romance novel before. It was also missing about 30 pages near the end, and the writing was such that I didn't actually notice until a character started talking and magging on Mary Reed, if I, memory serves, that I had zero memory of. Anyway... All that to say, I'm loving the podcast and look forward to each new episode. Thank you for doing this. Aww. So we kind of love that. And I want to hear, I think both of us want to hear more from y'all about, you talk to a lot, like most people our age and they have in their 30s or 40s, <laughs> 30s. Um, Hitting up 40s. Yeah. Like, hold on. Hold on. Grasping. <laughs> um, but I have these similar kind of experiences where... They were at someone's house and they saw a book that looked interesting. Like, oh, there's lady pirates on it. How fun can this be? And then I'm like, what? And then they found out that it had fucking in it. Yeah. And they, when I was a kid, I was honestly, I was reading these books uh, like partially for information. Mm -hmm. I wanted to know how it happens. Yeah. And so. <laughs> does it feel like when it happens, you know. So we've chosen today. Our book is Palomino, because this is one that you remember. Palomino yes. by Danielle Steele. Yes. And, I mean, Danielle Steele is one of those absolutely omnipresent um, uh, authors. Uh, and, you know, they were they were just everywhere. They were on everybody's mm -hmm. nightstand at the time. And I was a super horsey girl. Like, um, yeah, I took dressage lessons, actually. Like, I had, like, um, boots and little, little, yeah. Um, and I just, I loved horses. I love books about horses, but actually this was not my first Daniel Steele book. I have like funny, I have a very specific memory. Um, I was an incredibly voracious reader and I'm sure that a lot of our podcast listeners can identify with that, that I was at my aunt Laverne's house in Hawkinsville, Georgia, and I had run out of books. Yes. 
Oh my god. Uh, and then just in case you were thinking, like, Courtney's accent is much stronger than mine. And you're like, is she really from the South? I have an Aunt Laverne. Yes. Hey, Aunt. <laughs> hey, Laverne. So, hey, Aunt Laverne. And on that Aunt Laverne's bookshelf where I went looking was a um, message from Nam, which is another early yes. Daniel Steele book. I remember book. that one, too. Oh, yeah. Oh, there's two dudes in that one. So, oh. And that was my first one. And then I'm sure that I read this probably right after that because, yeah, um, I read a bunch of them eventually. And uh, there, there came a point where I was still, like, in middle school. So I must have started these when I was, like, 10 mm-hmm. or so. Um, that I got halfway through and realized I'd already read it. And that's when I stopped reading these. Yeah. So her earlier books are definitely better, I would. Everybody says that. And I, I'm not going to go back and uh, she put out one just like this month. Well, I think what <laughs> happened too, and we'll get more into this, is like she does, Danielle Steele now does kind of what Nora Roberts does is where they have people writing under their name. Um, I don't know if Nora Roberts does that or not. I kind of feel like that she doesn't. But James Patterson does. Yeah. But I don't know about. But I don't, but know. I don't, I don't know. Nora Roberts like, puts out so much. So I know. How could she possibly not? I don't know. Exactly. But. OG Danielle Steele is a boss, and this book was a pleasure. But before we get into the book, today we are drinking, to go with our horse theme, we have Sarah brought Pedrillo. It's a Malbec, and the staff at Morganelli's has, like, the little shelf talker that said that they think that it's, it's their best deal in Malbec. My favorite thing that happened at Morganelli's was he said to you what? Yeah, he said, are you looking for something weird again? Now, this is the Saturday before Christmas, by the way. So you're listening to this from the future. Um, the place was packed. I had to park across the road, but he was like, oh, yeah, you're looking for something weird? Like, yes, I need a cheap red wine with a horse on it. Morganelli's, when you need some weird shit. Yeah. Morganelli's. You'll find some weird shit one way or the other. I brought the original Dark Horse um, because there's a horse in this book that features prominently named Black Beauty. So Dark Horse, Black Beauty, whatever. We'll see. I'm sure it's fine. So, Palomino. Oh, um, before I say this, um, have y'all seen Daniel Steele's writing desk? It's amazing! We have a picture of oh the blog post. Oh my god, it's amazing! I mean, you can Google it, too. But it's fucking goals is what it is. Oh my god. It's so the most baller thing I've ever seen If you seen have not life. seen it, and you're thinking about these books as being an expression of women's, um, you know, search for money and fame and recognition, you're going to want to look I at this. I feel like it's lemonade in death yes. form. Like, oh, my God. And definitely, she actually writes there. It's not just it's like a thing. the best thing I've ever seen yes. in my life. Okay. So, see that, and it will be on this blog post yes. that we're, you know, but just FYI, you need this in your life. Okay, so Palomino, Palomino was written in 1981. 1981, and here is the description. Samantha Taylor is shattered when her husband leaves her for another woman. She puts her advertising career on hold and seeks refuge at a friend's California ranch where she loses herself in the daily labor of ranch life. Here, she discovers the healing power of trusted friends, simple joys, and hard work. She also meets Tate Jordan, the ranch foreman, and a tumultuous relationship ensues. When Tate disappears and a fall from a horse changes Samantha's life forever, she is confined to a wheelchair and must look deep inside herself to find the courage to begin again now fighting the battles of the handicap she knew she uh, ah. (laughs) now fighting the battles of the handicapped she finds new challenges new loves and even the adopted child she's always longed for okay these descriptions are either so vague to be useless or give you every spoiler in the goddamn book like that is literally everything that happens in this book why would you make that the jacket copy I know, it's so crazy. <laughs> well, no, like, it's in a Danielle Steele book. It's not, oh, it's not yeah. a jacket copy. Because the jacket, the back of cover is, of course, taken up entirely by a giant picture of Danielle Steele. You have to go into the book to get the, the description. Because um, that's how fucking big she was. And is still, but I mean, at the time, she sold, God, she sold more than Jesus did. Um, so, respect <laughs> on Danielle. Um so, yeah, what else actually happens in that book? Well, pretty much, yeah. So, Samantha is um, one of those, like, hyper-confident, this thing is still beautiful women. She's 31. Beautiful. She's at the top of her career. She's an advertising creative. Yes. She's um, got long, silver blonde hair. Which you'll hear a lot about. Oh, her hair. She's very smart. She's good at her job. She's nice. She is she's, nice, yeah. yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah she's, she's not a bitch. She's, like, nice. Well, um, yeah, when we meet her, she's trudging up to the top floor of her amazingly expensive New York apartment. Yeah. It's a walk-up, right? So it's a, it's a dump. 
um, because uh, it's like several months after her husband left her. Her husband is a like national news anchor, like so, yes. like Wolf Blitzer or Anderson Cooper, somebody you see on the news every fucking Again, night. From the physical description of him, I see him as Dauber. From the, the TV show coach. Blonde men aren't hot. I'm sorry. I'm, I apologize to all of our blonde yeah. men. I've never thought they're hot. And he's a blonde man, so. I feel like he's like that toe-headed blonde. I like a dark, sandy blonde. Like, give me a McConaughey blonde <laughs> all day long. I like a sandy blonde, but this guy. I, I mean, I'll take again. a Steve Rogers, I guess. But, okay, so, and this guy has anyway. left her. And just to salt in the wound. Well, several salts in the wound. A, for so his co-host. Salts. So she has to see them on TV every night. And, of course, yes. she can't not see him. And then, B, she's infertile. Although, right. they say sterile throughout the Yeah, um, they use the, the term thing. sterile. But this is 1981, so. Um, and so, and she got, he left because, finally left because he got her pregnant. So, yeah. she gets to watch this lady getting all, like, glowy and bigger and bigger. And they're talking about the nursery and that kind of fucking banter, which, just giving the news. Um, and Sam is miserable. And here's the thing, like, in 81, the news isn't great. Yeah. Like, so, you know, you got the Cold War happening. You got shit going down in... The AIDS epidemic is The AIDS cold. epidemic. You got shit yeah. going down in South America. I don't want to hear these two. Like, tell me what's going on in Guatemala, And bitch. they sound awful. They sound like oh, the worst people. Yeah. So, Dauber and, yeah, his, his girlfriend... Uh, but, and nobody likes her anyway. Like, no, nobody likes no his girlfriend. No one likes her. So, anyway, so she is miserable, but she is fortunate in that she works for a super nice guy and has a really good friend, a male friend, oh. who is, uh, like, a straight male friend no. who still does not almost or want to or anything have sex with her. They're just good friends. It Courtney's was so got a crush. Refreshing. And her crush Charlie. is not on Tate in the book. <laughs> her crush is on Charlie. Continue. I yes. Apologize. Charlie is super nice. And so he supports Harvey, her boss's decision to be like, honey, you have to leave. Okay? We'll keep your job for you. We are not pushing you out. You are just... You're bumming everybody the fuck out. Okay? So go. Go to that friend of yours out in California. And so finally she's like, well, and, and it's not a, it's not a request. Like you got to spend at least a couple months there. Yeah. So she goes, she goes um, to uh, Catherine Lord. No, Caroline, Caroline Lord. Caroline. Um, her ranch out in California. And Caroline was the, is it mother or aunt? I forget. Um, of, uh, of Samantha's uh, college roommate. And they were all very close. And she was, was very dead. much what Caroline, like they're very similar. Like Caroline was a movie actress who married a director and got and was widowed at the age of like thirty, and then was like, "Peace out." Yeah, I'm buying a horse ranch and mm-hmm. I'm, I'm gone. And, and Sam does have a long history with horses, as yeah. in like a a very expensive. These people are all very expensive. <laughs> um, like you know, used to ride at Madison Square Garden. She used to ride um, Eastern, although it never it never comes up again. She you know, but um, this, so this is all Western saddles and stuff. So she thinks she's just gonna like take the rest cure. But Caroline says, "Hey, if you want to, why don't you go and work with the men?" And and Sam has the sense and the the sensitivity to realize that this is a major gift yeah. that yeah that here she is she's kind of horning it on their terrain but she's really fortunate and she's like grateful to have something to do and she wants to ride so yeah she does and she kind of proves herself to them um she is a good writer she hasn't written in a while but they um the the assistant foreman <laughs> The, the assistant, assistant ma- to the assistant manager. Um, uh, Tate, who is hot as shit, by the way. I remember Tate very well. Um, <laughs> doesn't think much of her, because, yeah, here she is, like, horned in and somebody he's got to take care of. What's up, but, city girl? Yeah. <laughs> but yeah. gives her, like, the laziest, crappiest horse. And, like, you know, she impresses him, rides all day, gets super sore. It's all, it's, it's great, actually. There is a horse on the ranch that Caroline has just bought. He's an off-the-track thoroughbred. His name is Black Beauty, and he's, like, a lot of horse. And so she gets permission first, and she rides him, but she's really fucking irresponsible about it. By the way, Tate's right about this, that she's riding, she's jumping streams, she does not scatter the terrain, she does not know anything about this horse or about, like, this ranch yet. Samantha's in pain and making irresponsible decisions, and she's making irresponsible decisions on a horse. So isn't that a bad idea to do? Because Tate is like, you know what, that's really fucking dangerous. And also, she's going to, like, ride him out before breakfast, and like, at four in the morning, I guess, because the ranch wakes up early. And then she's, like, not going to, like, brush him down. Like, she's going to, like, just skirt her responsibilities because she's... That's, like, the one inconsiderate thing that she does throughout all of this. So he's right, okay? But, like, he... Finally, like, he starts to like her because she does work really hard. Like, she does prove herself with, like, hard work, and she's sensitive about their spaces and everything. And so they they start to warm to one another. And there's a Christmas thing where he's, like, he always plays Santa, and he's really good with the kids. And so, like, yeah, there's some sparks are flying. You also find out through oh yeah Ranch Hand Grapevine, Ranch Hand Grapevine, 
as a band, and I've just named it. <laughs> um, so Ranch Hand Grapevine lets us know that Tate had a wife that left him, and he has a son, and the wife, the son, and... An adult son. An ad- well, he's an adult son now, but, yeah. like, the wife, the son, and then... I think there was, like, a stepfather were in a car accident, and the wife and the stepdad were killed. There's a lot of tragedy. In There's a lot life. of tragedy. So, but, yeah. So, Tate's got Put some baggage. He's got, yeah. Hold on to that. And then, and, and, and anyway, like, she was his ex-wife because I think it was something, I mean, she was, she left. And so, yeah. all that business. And also, we found out through, not just through the ranch grapevine, because they're all very respectful, but, like, ranch she's hand. noticed... <laughs> she's noticed, and like her roommate noticed back before she died. Like every time in this book, There's a lot, um, yeah. but Bill, the uh, the actual foreman, um, like like you never you can never prove it. Like he's always extremely polite to Caroline, but you know, everybody thinks there might be something going on there. So oh, like they did, like no, like yeah, they, she starts to hear doors in the middle of the night, like yeah. that kind of thing. And she's like, no, not Bill. Well, maybe Bill, you know, like that kind of thing. Well, like Tate shows her the cottage. That Caroline yeah. and Bill used to sneak off to the sex cottage. Sex cottage. And they, uh, they, they, they make use of the sex cottage. They bang it out, and it is glorious, and it is wonderful. And they continue to bang it out, and it is completely consensual. Like, she says no at first, and then he stops, which I can't... I, I, it's amazing how traumatized I am by these books. <laughs> yes. Because, <laughs> like, I couldn't believe it. And, yeah, and... And so, but then they kind of, they start doing it. But there's this whole thing of the code of the ranch, which is the reason that Bill and Caroline can never be together, is that ranchers don't fuck ranch hands. Although, I mean, I guess they do, but they don't do it where anybody can see them doing it. So, I mean, they, you could never possibly get married. You could never really have a non-clandestine life together, all this. And so, immediately, Sam starts wanting a non-clandestine life together. I feel like, too, is that Sam is obviously still reeling and, like, healing from her shitty ex-husband and so she's putting all her eggs in this tape basket and this tape basket is fine y'all i mean it is really yeah. fine he's it's all like, like long dark haired and like broad shoulders and of course he's much older than her because they always he's salt and pepper books. like the, whenever they throw the salt and pepper in there he's got them and the other thing i like about this book um to segue is that she's 30 and he's like 40 they're realistic people ages like they're yeah. not 17 and 35. You I mean, know? you'll never see one of these books where they're the same age. It just doesn't happen. So. But I'm saying, like, they're both, like, adult ages. Anyway, mm-hmm. continue. And so. they talk to each other like adults, too. Yeah, so, yeah, like you said, Sam is wanting more, and Tate is like, I love you. They're, like, they, they jump to I love you <laughs> oh, super yeah. fast. Yeah, 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 yeah. Which, I mean, is a warning sign, because, like, obviously, like, Sam has been hurt. Tate has emotional intimacy problems also, yeah. which, of course, she can't see coming. So he actually goes to the, to the length of moving his cabin with somebody else so that she can sneak in and out un- unseen, and that's how they just conduct their lives for a couple months. Yeah. And... So, and it's kind of coming to an head because, and, and of course, Bill and Caroline have been doing this for decades and decades and decades, but, like, Sam is younger than Caroline, and Bill is like, no, no, fuck this. And even Caroline's not happy with no. this situation. There's a part, like, the only care, like, the only off character scene that you get, really, is Caroline trying to talk to Bill about let's get married, and Bill's like, that's not how ranch hands do it. Go to the ranch. Go to the, go to the ranch. So... Like, I just want to yell, go to the ranch at things now. Go to the ranch! But, yeah, so she's obviously not happy. And so it's kind of a portent to what goes on. Yeah, so, yeah, what you're seeing in Caroline is a little bit of a ghost of Christmas future yeah. for for Sam. But and Sam loves this guy, and the sex is um, fucking amazing. And she's yeah. finding out, like, how terrible a lover her ex-husband was and all that. Dauber was not getting it done. <laughs> So, so it all comes to my head when he, oh, uh, just for her, he gets a color TV in his quarters. Oh, God. And she hasn't said who her husband was. And, I mean, the fact is, yeah, he's famous. But at the same time, you don't want to come in all from New York City being all like, oh, yeah, my husband, Wolf Blitzer. Yeah, I mean, yeah, and then that's the thing. Like, I don't think she was... A- at it, anyway. Nobody's that famous anymore, so it's not like like I guess like Connie Chung used to be that famous, or like Diane Sawyer, or somebody like that. Yeah, it's it, like it was yeah, like she was. It was Friday. like she was fucking Dan Rather, but a dick. <laughs> yeah, and so she didn't mention not, it was Dan, Dan not Rather. not the Dan Rather look like from our last book, <laughs> Christmas <laughs> Magic or whatever that was, the bewitching hour. <laughs> no, 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 the actual a Dan soup son of Sting and Dan <laughs> Rather. Okay, but no, yeah. So she's fucking. She was married to basically the blonde dumb ver. Like John Tesh. Like <laughs> yes. John Tesh. Live at Red Rocks. 
Yeah, so... But he, if she hasn't told Tate that, and frankly, it's none of his fucking business. No. And he, he has told her nothing about his life, by the way. Yeah. She doesn't even know, like, well, she knows his she's son's never met his son. name. Yeah. Another portent. <laughs> yes. So what happens is he gets a color TV because he thought that she'll like it, which is super sweet, by the way. It is sweet. But then, like, okay, so she hasn't watched the 6 o'clock news in ages... By the way, they have a six o'clock. I don't even know. We don't have TV anymore. Um, and 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 she's like, oh, he's joking with her about like, hey, you like that dude? You think that dude's hot? And she's cracking up, and he doesn't understand why. And she finally says, oh yeah, that's my ex-husband, and he's furious. Yeah, he because he the feels fuck. like he was being. I, I get he, it. Not, but yeah, like he he's turns, like you come here and play around. He you know? bros out. He bros out yeah. a little bit. Yeah. Well, and the fact is, like, I, I I feel that there is an irritate. And that the book, like, Ur Tate would not have done this, but the book needed some conflict. Yeah. And so the book made Tate do this. And so, and she's like, fine, fine, fuck you. I'll see you in the morning. Um, well, guess what? She gets up in the morning and he has completely ghosted, as in he has loaded he everything up. And this is close enough that, that, that she could sneak over to his cabin, but he has, like, I don't know, done all this in his stocking yes. feet, loaded his entire belongings up, and vanished. He ghosts her. Yeah. So... He goes uh, her. And she's, of course, heartbroken because she was barely over. Oh, and it's terrible. Uh, this and mother, yeah, so Tate ghosts her. And then she starts, basically, like, she she gets a little single white female, y'all. She, she starts, gets a little she does a letter writing female. campaign. Yeah, like, she <laughs> starts writing all the ranches. In the world. Around. Like, she's even, like, looking at Argentina. Yeah. And... She's writing all the ranches. I imagine that she went to the library. <laughs> I mean, I don't, yeah, I don't like the, the ranch. <laughs> Some of those network. business directories that we have now that like we don't use ever, but yeah. I guess that that's what she's using. Yeah, she goes fucking nuts, and until finally it's time where she has to decide if she's going back to New York or not. Yeah, yeah. Well, but, she gets forced back to yeah. New York. Caroline's like, "Girl, girl, you gotta go. Girl, yeah. bye." Like, yeah, I'm done buying stamps. I forget yeah. how much stamps cost when I was a kid, but like, still, I'm done buying stamps. Yeah, it was, you have got to go. She's like, "You gotta get out of here." And so she goes, and, like, she reacclimates to her life. Charlie, Aww. Courtney's boyfriend in this book, <laughs> Charlie's is so amazing sweet. and supportive. Uh, by the way, we should mention that Charlie, and this is kind of tough for Sam, Charlie's wife is pregnant again. And that's right. Like, Charlie, Charlie is married. They have, like, married. a million babies. Charlie is married, and Sam is friends with both Charlie and his wife, Melinda, Melly. Like, there's no weirdness there. It's just yes. a really good, healthy Which relationship. you never see. It's amazing. Like, it's yes. like how real people actually act in their real lives. And oh, so, my God. They had three boys, and Melly is pregnant. Yeah. And, like, Charlie doesn't want to say anything because, uh, you know, it's a little fraught. Yeah. But yeah, so and she comes back and like Nellie's just getting bigger and bigger and 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 so she wants to um she's assigned a big car ad and if you learned anything from Mad Men, it's that like the car the car is the thing. If you have a car, your agency is yes. has arrived. So of course she's getting out her like um, female blue balls in through her art, which means that she's like, you know what we need to have? And they don't say what kind of car it is. I like to assume that it's like a Geo Metro. She's like, you know what we need cowboys. <laughs> I saw it as like again. This is gonna be the theme of this podcast is me talking about the old Infinity commercials <laughs> with Jonathan Price and Jonathan Price and his turtleneck. So I imagine it automatically being like an Infinity or a Jaguar. Like that's what I saw. See, but I mean, it's all cowboys. Luxury, and though. the cowboys are not Luxury. driving the car or anything. Like it's I don't but know. That, but see, like a Geo is not a finely beautiful horse. Like a Geo is just like a meh. Like it's like a corgi. Well, Whereas, yeah. like a Jaguar. But they is didn't like a have horse. like this enormous American truck market. Like they well, do no, now. but I mean, obviously, obviously, it's a high end. Obviously, it's a high-end luxury. Like, you don't just get a Clio for a Geostorm. Yeah, she wins a Clio eventually for sorry, this sorry, ad right campaign right. that she's doing. And so she's uh, she's scouting ranches for this, but it's really kind of a cover for her to be looking for Tate still. <laughs> I mean... <laughs> and she keeps ca trying to cast these cowboys, and she's like, not Tate enough. I not feel Tate like enough. on the Spotify for this... <laughs> Rockwell's I always feel like somebody's watching me uh, yeah. has to be on it because she, she like, is hardcore style. He is fucking lucky that she did not find him. Because mm. <laughs> she, yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. Anyway, okay. But so, so she does hire a Tate alike. He's a British gay guy. Yes. And we'll talk about that yeah. a little bit later about representation in this book and yes. how it's carried out. It's interesting. It's it interesting. is interesting because Danielle Steele, again, she's all right. Thank God for her. Yeah. 
Because we, we've certainly seen worse. God. We have a, we have a yes. lot more plot to bang yes, through. I, so. All these books are 500 pages. I'm sorry. So, yeah. So, she's out on these ranches doing the filming for this commercial. And it's very hard work and all. But So, she's on these uh, wonderful ranches. And there's just finally this ranch where there is another fine, fiery horse. And that horse's name is Grey Devil. And so, at the end of the day of filming, she like she's like, can I ride this horse? She's like, yeah, you can ride this horse. I mean, be careful. But they don't tell her about the fucking ravine in the middle of a pasture. Yes. That you would never put a pasture there, and there's, like, no fence or anything. So she rides hell for leather. She's thinking about Tate, and the horse refuses the ravine jump because it's a smart horse, and there she goes in the ravine. And it's, 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 like, it's, it's real. Like, she it's is, catastrophic. He is and seriously hurt. And Charlie is freaking out. Like, he commandeers a truck, and Charlie. she, oh, my God. Like, Charlie Y'all, stabs Charlie. Up. Charlie. Charlie. So Charlie. she gets rest of the hospital. Charlie pretends to be her brother. Because decisions have to be made. Yes. And here's the thing. Like, it's the 1980s. I don't think HIPAA was such a thing. Somebody was like, who's our family? And Charlie's like, I'm our family. They're like, how do you relate He never gets in trouble for this. But, yeah. Again, there was no real HIPAA violation. He was violation. doing his best. And her actual family sucks. Her mother's her, terrible. Yeah, her family sucks. So Charlie has to make a right then split decision uh, which was really has? not a decision at all it's either like she'll yeah. probably be paralyzed or she'll uh, die she'll die yeah, yeah. so, so Charlie's like you had like, to say yes like they would probably done that even without his consent, okay. so Charlie's frankly. like do the surgery damn it you know <laughs> and um, I'm sure it haunts him you know he doesn't talk about oh, the rest oh, of the oh Charlie oh. and Charlie's cute too yeah anyway so she has the surgery it goes well and then... And they finally, they transfer her back to New York City. It's like this whole thing with a private plane, because this is all very rich people things that rich people do. Um, nobody ever talks about how much any of this costs. It's, you know, it's amazing. I don't, yeah, they, here, here's the thing, y'all. Not only do they charter a private plane, they also have all of the medical staff. They have to, like, have... Yeah, the spe- surgeon comes with her. They have to have special, like, air traffic routes. Like, this is a multi-million dollar move. Like... Oh, God, it just proves to be rich in the 80s. Yeah. Like, you know. You 80s about, rich was, like, so rich. 80s rich was amazing. You got the best fucking health care. Meanwhile. I mean, meanwhile. Like, you were literally, your neurosurgeon would get on the plane and go and stay a few days with you while you yeah. settled in yeah. to your new hospital. Yeah. Yeah. Because she's stuck in the hospital for a year. Yeah. Which I don't honestly think happens anymore. No, I think, I mean, honestly, I think if you have this catastrophic of an injury. And now, here's the thing. I think what's different now is that. Her hospital, what they call the hospital, yeah, I think maybe would be, rehab would is in be the a hospital. rehabilitation. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I do think the, the year thing is plausible. But yeah, I do think I that mean, she would be like in a hospital. You go home. Yeah, yeah, I think she'd be in a hospital. But affiliated. the shitty thing is, and I think I suspect now, I don't know what they do now, what best practice is now, but I think they would have told her long before they do in yeah. this thing. So she's in a full body cast for a while. Well, okay. But nobody sits her down and says, like, she's in a good enough mind to be laughing and making jokes about her full body yes. cast to say, oh, guess uh, what? what a barbecue. You like, have had, like, a, you know, complete whatever. This see, is a catastrophic. You are. Like, not going to be walking. You're You're going to be, uh, they won't even tell her she's going to be in the hospital for a year. Yeah, they don't, and they, yeah, yeah, they, like, they never say, like, and the reason why you don't do that is because what happened, happens, was that her shitty mother and her shitty stepfather come, and then they, you know, they talk to the doctor, and of course the doctor gives them all the information, and they come back and say, you need to come back with us because you're never going to walk again. Yeah. I'm trying the dark horse. How is it? It smells like wine. (laughs) It tastes like wine, but with a dirtier, like. <laughs> like maybe somebody did their balls in it. Just it's a little, like moss. A little. Moth, like it's, you know what? I feel like it's, it's the, it's the big red blend. I feel like it's, I'm free range. Well, I tell you I'm what. I'm riding the gray devil. This is one of these books where everybody has sex after they've been riding a horse for like eight hours. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yes. Okay. All right. Back to back to yeah. the longest plot in the world. I know. Well, they're all like this, but this one we actually like this book, yes. so we're not like you know. We both finished this book, stuff. this five hundred page book, in like two days because so. it was so refreshing that like after all we've been reading, Daniel Steele is fucking Shakespeare. Okay? Oh my god! It was like it was so good. It was competent. It was like Proust. I was like, <gasps> it was like such genius. a genius. There, I was like, this woman is a genius. Anyway, all right. Continue. Yeah, I think we might be a little bit like we we've lost our moral and artistic yeah, compasses. No. But yeah, so um, so she is gravely injured. She goes through rehab, and she has her ups and downs. She's in it. belligerent for a little bit until yeah. Charlie kicks her ass and is yeah. like, "Stop feeling sorry for yourself. You're alive." It all seems stop actually being, and he, he, like the best part. He's like, "Stop being a bitch." <laughs> and I, again, I love Charlie because he's he's there for it. He's he and Harvey are both 
there and are really good male friends. And again, we'll talk about this more, but it's so refreshing to see this whole, everybody is super supportive. Well, like, it's, it's, everybody it's cares that, about and also, her. like, in a decade where, especially in a decade, in a decade... Where, Essentially, let's call this a 70s novel. This is nineteen eighty. Like, we're in literature. Yeah. It's impossible for to find solid male-female fr- platonic friendships. I mean, fuck, it's hard to find it now. Yeah. Like, this is what you have. You have Harvey, who's basically like a father to her, and Charlie, who's a brother to her. And there's never any weird, unrequited... never. It's so refreshing, and it's so nice to see well-written characters. Oh, my God. This was, like, this was a breath of fucking fresh air. But finally, yeah, okay, so she goes through, um, you know, rehab. She goes through occupational therapy. She learns how to live in a world that in 1991 was even less friendly to people using wheelchairs than it is today. I mean, she's a rich bitch, but... Oh, yeah, she's a rich bitch, but New York is tough. New York, yeah. I watched a video once, and it was um, a a guy who uh, used a wheelchair, like, especially a a way more intense wheelchair. Like, I I, I think he may have even, like, controlled it with, like, like finger wiggles and, like, mouth and that kind of thing. And he's like, I'm going to show you what else like to get around in New York and he wouldn't accept anybody helping of course because of the point was you know and people were trying to be like nice and helpful but he's like no 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 my point is that I am trying to do my daily life in New York with zero help and he just couldn't do it he, he continued to just like run into a point where like well I cannot walk up these 50 stairs I have to say this is a little sharing I guess this book the thing I liked about it my mother who passed away in February of 2017 had muscular dystrophy And so she was wheelchair bound. And one of the things that she had always wanted to do was to go to New York, to New York City. And we all knew it was kind of an impossibility. Because, again, we're talking about in the 2000s. Like, literally everything in New York has been grandfathered in. How how difficult it is. And so I I enjoyed this book from kind of that empowering standpoint of you've got this character that's in a wheelchair and... It becomes kind of a byproduct. I do think that she could have spent a little bit more time... Learning how to do it. Well, like, but just on what it really is, because Samantha just, like, gets super used to it super fast. And, I mean, like, not... I mean, I mean, I know that, you know, obviously, <laughs> that's what the book is, but... It is nice to see this kind of representation. Something that I it, thought was very um, uh, realistic is that she didn't go see Caroline. She she knew that Bill had a stroke yeah. and that things were bad on the ranch. She didn't go see it because she was afraid to travel. Right. And I can see that being absolutely... Yeah. Like, say so you learn how to figure out your own apartment. Yeah, and she moves into Charlie's building. It's so yeah. cute. Oh. And I mean, like, you've learned how to, like, do the things that you do every day. But the idea yeah, of is just overwhelming new. of doing it something new. Yeah, so. I mean, like, my grandfather uh, flew and he was in a wheelchair after a stroke he flew to my college graduation and if my um you know my aunt and uncle had not flown with him like the they have to take apart your wheelchair yeah like to get on the, like I'll, i just don't see how like it would have even been possible on his own even though it's supposed to be possible on your own like, that's the whole point yeah. is that you should be able in this uh, post ada world to by yourself go to the airport get on an airplane get off the airplane yeah. you know and, and it's not it's not at all possible and especially in 1981 so right. I wish that it had focused more on her struggles, and we're going to talk a, yeah. a bit more about how this book deals with disability in a while. But uh, yeah, I thought it was fascinating. Like um, I, that was such a real thing that she's like, "Oh, I really want to go see Caroline. I don't dare. I don't dare get on a plane." Yeah, yeah, I get it. Yeah. Um, so, well, all that, you know, she's getting used to it. She's back at her job. She's, of course, kicking ass at her job because, like, one thing that you can do, I mean, even if she's afraid to travel, certainly, like, you know, her job is, is not ranch handing work. It is, like, being right. that executive work. So she, she's handling her business, and she finds out that things are going way worse at the ranch and that Bill has gotten worse and worse and worse, and finally Bill dies. And then Caroline dies soon after. I think that Bill probably didn't tell her where he hid his medicine. I don't know. Um, the Caroline dies of a broken heart. Uh, maybe she needed yeah. the fresh air from all that door opening <laughs> and closing. Um, and surprise, surprise, they have left the ranch to Sam. Right. So, and she didn't expect that. She, I, I feel like, oh God, like, and I get that, that like you have so much going on in your life and you feel super guilty, although she didn't really talk about how guilty she felt, that you kind of just don't think about this other thing that you've got on your periphery and then like they go and die on you and yeah. you feel terrible. But, so she's like, well, I guess I need to at least go see it before I sell it. 
And she takes Charlie and Charlie's wife. And then uh, Charlie's had the, 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 the baby and yeah, his daughter the that they named after Sam. It's adorable. They all go for a long weekend, I think. Like, it's a vacation. Mm-hmm. And the ranch is amazing. Still not signed to Tate. But she gets this idea kind of starting in her head. She's like, well, why can't I ride? You yeah. know? Like, I can't ride. And it's terrible. I don't want to go to this ranch because I don't want to think about how I can't ride. But, like, you know, of course, we all know that there are many ways which people with disabilities can participate in sports. You know, even yeah. in kind of extreme sports. So um, she goes back and she's thinking about it. And at the same time, Harvey offers her the creative director job. He wants to retire. And she's giving it to her. And she's like, mm, oh, gosh, I have to think. But finally, she has the damn sense to realize that what she really wants to do is, and she, oh, she talks to a kid at the, at the rehab facility. She, like, you make, know. Yeah, she befriends a little dude, Alex. I forgot about him. And he kind of helps her make this decision. So what she decides when she gets to the ranch is, and I think maybe Caroline had a part in this because she then talks about later, like, this was Caroline. No, she was lying idea. about yeah. that. She was lying to Tate. Yeah. Um, so, I'm sorry. Oops, spoiler. <laughs> so... She decides what she's going to do is to turn this ranch into a, like a, basically a facility for children with, with physical handicap to come and learn to ride like a rehabilitation center. Um, It's a camp. really. Yeah, Yeah, it is. It's a camp. And so she spends the next year of her life, like her first year post Tate is in kind of rehab and her second year is putting together this ranch and she she's like the kind of i get her okay when she has a project that she's interested in yeah she is whole fucking hard yeah, on so that so she she's she, selling like she, they sell all the cattle which yeah. allows her to like obviously they need special equipment therapy horses yeah, like, yeah they need to pay she's everything. like paying like she gets ranch hands that are specifically designed for it and one of the ranch hands is this redheaded mystery guy named jeff <laughs> jeff Who's amazing with kids? I think I actually made a horse noise. Stuff. I'm sorry. You did. You were. Yeah. So they're getting people who really like kids. Yeah. yeah. I mean, they're hiring. Of course, there were great people in the ranch already. Some of them, like, kind of laughed because like they didn't know what's going to happen. But yeah. so, you know, and then they hire people specifically who have experience with children yeah. and who are not. Like, and I like that in wheelchairs. the book they talk about her going to like different hospitals. Like she put like it's not just like oh I'm going to do a thing like. I no, mean, she talks to she, doctors. Yeah, I mean, she almost was like, it was almost like Daniel still talking about, and then the insurance forms yes. that we need. So I like that. I it, was, like it was it was really research. great because yeah. yeah, she didn't she didn't advertise. Yeah. She went to various like spinal doctors and doctors like who like with, sixty like, cities doctors. or something. Yeah, like, yeah, and so. and said, hey, if you have any um, any any kids, yeah. send them to me. And she's networking. I mean, yeah, it's great. It's actually yeah. awesome. It's really cool, and it's going well. It's got, like she's starting like a tutoring, like like so you can yeah. do year round with the tutoring. She puts school. a pool in. Yeah, she puts pool in. Yeah, I mean, like, she's, like, yeah, thought she's about this. On it. This is not just, like, a half-assed thing is what we're trying yeah, to say. Yeah, And then, okay, so this kid, and she's never had this happen. A kid gets delivered by a social worker. Timmy. Tiny Tim. Timmy. 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 Nobody, nobody's called Timmy. Tiny and Tim. I, I didn't even really give a spell T-I-M-M-I-E. It was terrible. I was yes. like, what is this weird spelling? Like, this is the only misstep, Danielle. Yeah. I don't like your name, and I don't like the spelling. Anyway. So, poor Timmy is an abused child who's been brought here by a social worker because his mother, who is a heroin addict, got picked up, and he had been alone in the apartment for, like, weeks, eating yeah, beer weeks and, like, and weed. Bees. And then, yeah, it's Oh, terrible. he had polio. Yeah, he had, that's why he was in a wheelchair. So, they, they, they brought him, because he's a wheelchair user, to this place, because I guess they had no idea what else to do, which probably happened. I don't know. The, great, the other great thing about this, and, like, this is where people are going to start writing terrible things to me, and it's going to be me that says it. I'll take, I'll fall on the sword. The great thing about this book this 1981 book is one of the forms of child abuse that Timmy <laughs> goes through is that he's not vaccinated. Woo! So that's how he got polio. Yeah. Because his mother was so fucking shitty that she didn't, she didn't vaccinate even bother him. to go vaccinate. I don't know where you got polio in what, I guess, 1970. He's six. So it would be Jesus, like 1974. Like, yeah. yeah. So yeah. <laughs> Come at me. Come at me. Come at both of us bitches. Cause Come like, at me. That is, vaccines are endorsed by bodice tipplers. We're not sponsored by the vaccines, but we're in, we endorse them personally, professionally, and socially. Yes. Vaccines. <laughs> Try it's not a, to die. It's what you should do. Yeah. Okay. So, so, yeah. So, there's Timmy. And, of course, her heart breaks for this poor kid. Takes him on and says, like, don't even worry about, like, you know, like, when the money runs out. She's very it. irresponsible with Timmy and, like, tell him, you can live here forever. Yeah. Which you don't do with the six-year-old's feelings, okay? You don't do it with, yeah, like, oh, anyway. So, okay. So, 
Timmy. <laughs> we're so deep into this. I know this is such a long book. I feel like I have to like take a break for you. And, like spell it a little bit for you. So okay, so Timmy stays with her. They have a beautiful bond. She wants to adopt Timmy. Tells Timmy he never has to go to his mother again. Yeah. The mom is like, um, Actually, fuck off. That's my baby. And there's the whole, like, court scene thing. And remember that she's a single woman. She's a single woman in a wheelchair. Yeah. But she's a single rich-ass woman in a wheelchair. I, know, I feel right? like they keep forgetting that. Well... I think they try to excuse it for plot reasons by having the judge be, like, so yeah. about maternal rights. Long story short, Timmy gets returned to his mom. But don't worry, y'all. Don't worry. Yeah, it's gonna be all Don't right. worry. It's gonna, it's gonna work out. So she's, of course, heartbroken. But then, like... Three weeks later. Oh, wait. No, no, no. Before that happens, to so- to salve her broken heart, oh, Jeff God. comes in. Jeff. Jeff. Now, do you remember at the beginning of me talking about all of this? <laughs> it was so long ago. So oh, long ago. God. I said something about Tate having a son that survived a car crash. She's Everybody an knows what's going on here except for anybody in this book. Yes. So, Jeff is all like, hey, girl. And she's like, hey, Jeff. And Tate is older enough than her that yeah. this is a legit thing. Yeah. That he's so younger. he's like, hey, girl, what's up? And she's let's, like, let's do nah, it. you know. You're real a- sad about Timmy. Let's fuck. And she's like, maybe. But, you know, also, like, that's not a good idea. So <laughs> he's like, whatever. It's New Year's. I'm going out. Woo! I've had two beers. So he's two had bears. two beers. And he, Guess what? He dies. He <laughs> dies in a drunk driving accident. Well, very difficult in 1981. Yes, like, he, it was very he dies, and then, like, the same, like, the next afternoon, she gets a call from the social worker who's like, hey, come to L.A., and she's like, it's not, why? I just it's had a new die. And he's like, just come on down here, girl. Just it's come a, on. It's a surprise. So she gets down. So the like lawyer she, does want to fuck her, by the way. She comes down. So, FYI. She comes down to L.A. from... I'm, I'm, I always put it like in Sacramento. Yeah, I don't know. It's outside of LA. Yeah. Somehow. So he's like, surprise, Timmy's birth mom OD'd, and he's been on his own for like three days. He's your Yay! Man. So yeah, it is. Court, Courtney has no compassion for Timmy's mom. I have a little I, bit. Of I compassion. have a little compassion with this. I don't have. A, I, like I was like, she's, she's a horror. She's a monster. But the book makes her. She such beat a monster. the kid. I didn't have compassion. Like, but I did. But I don't like how he's like surprised, yeah. and I don't like how they're like Timmy doesn't need any kind of therapy. <laughs> when obviously he does. So she gets Timmy, who is now her son. Yay. I mean, it was happy. It was happy. It's just like, damn, a woman who, she's 22, so she was 16 yeah. when this child was born. And yeah. she's, nobody wants to be a heroin addict, right? And they they make a big deal of her being a prostitute. So she's a mm. sex worker, and they call him a trick baby. Yeah. Yeah, so I mean. I like, in 81, I get this weird, uh, and it, it is funny because it's like Danielle Steele trying to write edgy. You know, like. <laughs> I mean, they're trying to stack the deck in favor of Sam. And I completely Obviously. understand that because they don't want it to seem like this rich lady is stealing his baby. Just been like, I mean, again, for like dramatic effect. Anyway, we're almost there, y'all. We're oh almost there. Just, just plug along with this because so, I feel like we've been talking for four hours about this book. But so she's got Timmy. Everything is fine. But then they find out Jeff going through his personal belongings. Oh, guess whose son it was? It's Tate. Yes. So, now she finally shows a little bit of like measured. Not being single white female when she just writes him a letter. Well, that's partly because, however, she doesn't want him to know that she uses a wheelchair. Now she doesn't want well, him to that know, too, but like, which is really sad. Like she's she's just terrified. Yeah. He, she doesn't want to see him. She doesn't want him to see her right. not able to use her legs. And it, it is really sad, honestly. So yeah, she writes his letter, and it turns out that Tate has bought a little concern up in Montana and had been trying to make it into a go over ranch so he could leave it to his son who has died. His son oh, is now his his ex wife is dead. His son is dead everyone's dead it's terrible i mean really th- th- so much tragedy in this book I mean, really it's so, like, yeah, nobody's ever really like hyped sad about it so they they, they had to bury jeff um without yeah. uh without him being there because well uh, he's the certain smell so well they couldn't it was something like they couldn't find the even they if had the to locate him. had yeah. gotten the, to the dad. Yeah, they had to locate him. Yeah, so and, yeah, he was starting to smell. So they, they buried him next to Caroline and Bill near the cabin and, and all. And the kids have like a little like horse riding ceremony. Yeah, it's, it's, it's real sweet. sweet. And because everybody loved Jeff. And then finally later Tate shows up to get his stuff. And, and, it, and okay, she so mails the stuff, she, but he wants to see his son's final. Oh, that's true. Card. And she had lied. Okay, she yeah. said that Caroline 
wanted, mm-hmm. out of the blue, decided that she wanted this ranch to be uh, for children to learn to ride horses who otherwise can't move on their own. So she lied because she didn't want Tay to know that she had been injured in this way. Especially, probably, she didn't say this because he told her not to do that. Yes, he was like, don't <laughs> ride crazy. Yeah, and she rode crazy. So, and, and, and so he's coming and she knows he's coming he's gonna hide. So he, she sneaks out by a horse Back to the cabin, and he finds her. And it takes him a while to understand because he doesn't really get that why she's not getting out the horse because it's a saddle. It's like a special saddle with like yeah. straps and stuff. And finally, he sees it, and of course, he's like, "I don't fucking care, Jesus!" Yeah. Like, and he and then she's like, "Well, you weren't fucking here, so like, whatever." But they make up, and it's real sweet. It the and oh, I'm sorry, it was a lot of plot. We had to get through it. We because really it's did. Fascinating fucking mating. One reason I really wanted to read this book is because I wanted to see how it dealt. I remembered, of course, that, that she'd had that spinal injury. And I wanted to see how this 1981 book dealt with disability. Right. And it was it, shocking to me how well it did. Okay, I, people throw around cripple. Um, that word a lot in this. Um, not a lot. Like, they won't say it to Sam. But, you know, like, again, having, like, here's 1980 the 1980 fucking one, by the having way. Having a mom that grew up with muscular dystrophy, like, it's a word that... I'm weirdly, like, inured to you, like, because you, like, when you're with someone like that, a lot of times that's a word they'll use for themselves because they're so upset about things. So, like, it, that didn't bother me. Like, because I felt like it was honest. Well, and, and, like, it, and it understood that you, that's not a word that you should, it, it's a word that like, has, like, a yeah, it has a negative connotation. I almost think, I don't want to say that it was too positive because yeah, I feel it like, was trying so hard. I, 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 you can tell that Danielle still either yeah. has a friend or a relative uh, who has some sort of spinal injury or is in a yeah. wheelchair or that she spent a ton of time on a ranch like that. Yeah. It's so, I mean, it's it's her story. It's not other people's. Like, nobody says she's inspirational right. or anything. It uses some terms that you wouldn't use anymore but not even very many of those no, not if any. anything it's too it's too positive i mean y'all yeah, this book like uh, i fell in a lot of love with this book <laughs> I, I really en- okay i really enjoyed it there's a lot of aspects to it that i i really liked um and i guess before we get into our questions and like dig into the book then we need to talk about our musical do we break? have a musical thing? Or we're going to have one. And we'll we are going to have this. one? Okay. Well, insert musical break. Insert musical In break. five, four, three, two, one. So today's uh, people who've agreed not to sue us are the Don Key Shotguns. Um, this is their song, Carolina Peach Blossom. They are a local band, uh, so they're not on Spotify and they're not on Amazon, but if you go to our website, bodicetiplers.com, uh, under this episode, we'll have a link to you uh, so you can hear more of their music. Should do 103 down the road of play Man, I'll be right behind her till her dying day Those rosy tail lights are worth the chase The lines are so sweet, they look cool to the touch She's the queen of the heat when she lets out the clutch Darling, that motor's awesome, will I ever catch up To the Carolina Peach Blossom Carolina Peach Blossom They talk all about her at the local drag strip Truth be told, she'll turn the corner on every limb Pink lips, hot wheels, and a heart of steel The lines are so sweet, they look cool to the touch She's the queen of the heat when she lets out the clutch Darling, that mode is awesome, will I ever catch up To the Carolina Peach Blossom Carolina Peach Blossom just around the corner, come on, rev it up I can start to buzz around Sweet sugar cup, sugar cup, sugar cup Sip 
pulls up beside me with the neon lights in a chrome bright work and it paints so white neon pinks in that petal that seems the lines are so sweet they look good to the touch she's the queen of the heat when she lets out the clutch darling that mode is awesome will i ever catch up to the carolina peach blossom 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 Okay, we're back. We Here ate, we are. We ate a lot. We um, took a snack break. Sorry y'all. You so, enjoyed music, you're fine. There is so much that is so interesting about this book. Oh my god. Like, not only... I don't even know if it was that good a book. It was just so much better than Captain Passion. But there's so much to unpack in this book. I think it's a good book. I'm going to put it down there and say that this was legitimately, on its own, a good book. I did not read it like it was a sign reading. Like, I, I mm-hmm. was into this goddamn book. And but there was so much that was interesting in it. So, like, let's first talk about... And I remember this from these other books. The Danielle Steel Woman... The aesthetic. You would, say, you would say that she was a Mary Sue in another genre, but I think that in romance, it's like... I don't even know if thing. she really is. Like, here's the thing. I don't... I... She's the, not perfect. The thing I like about a Danielle Steele woman is that she... I don't think it's a Mary Sue to say that she's attractive and she's good at things. Like... And she's I not, think it's nice to see that because I feel like what ends up happening, what tends to end... What tends to end up happening in this kind of genre, especially this early genre, is you're you're put into two you're put into one of two groups. You're the pretty girl who's fucking useless, or you're the average girl that like can do stuff and cares a lot. And I think that there is something to be said. Like you can't. I. I. I you're not one or the other. You can be both. And so I like that. And they are always professionally successful. The ones that yes. I can remember. Like, they I, might be young or they might be new or they might have flaws here and there. But they are always professionally good at what they choose to do. Yes. And, they're, and so, they're, yeah. And so, like. They have jobs. They have jobs. And they have high-paying jobs. And, I mean, she obviously is writing aspirational things for it's women. amazing. And it is, it is really great. And... Especially reading Danielle Steele now as, like, an adult woman in the, you know... Like, get it. Fucking get it, bitch. Yes, the later (laughs) 2000s. Like, it's this was such a breath of fresh air because she knew what she wanted. She never was like, ah. You know, it wasn't wasn't an Alicia Greycloud situation. She wasn't sad. I mean, okay, she was really sad. She was legitimately she had sad. To be but sad. But she wasn't about, just like but... weeping and exclaiming yes. and like whatever. She had pride, and but she, she wasn't a foolish kind of pride. A, like I enjoyed this. Like the thing that I'm gonna, you know, go out and say the thing that's great about this book versus some of the other ones that we have read is we've had characters that have had so much downtime where it's just like, and then she thought this. And then she did this. And then she exclaimed this. Like, bitch was busy. Yeah. Sam was busy. She yes. had purpose. She had drive. And the thing that I really liked about this book, y'all, is that I felt like Tate Returns was just kind of like a cherry on top. This would have been a happy ending book to me if she had never found In fact, him again. If you took Tate out of this book entirely, it would still be a good book. Yes. It doesn't even have to be a it romance like, book. Yeah, it's, like, it's just I, about a woman and I she thinks like happens to her. And Danielle she, Steele you know. is super smart and super tricksy because what she was selling women, she was like, hey, you're going to get a romance novel. But really, what I'm teaching you is that you can be a boss bitch all on your own. Yes. And you know what? I'm going to put a handsome cowboy in like some ass flattering pants. And that's going to be the thing that sells you. The best but, thing that he said to her was, I like the way the ass sits on top of your legs. I mean, it was great. <laughs> it like, was awesome. It was, she, I, I, I feel like now, especially because we live in an age of cynicism. Everybody's like, oh, Danielle, Sarah, but this, this is an important book. And I think. You should read this book. You will enjoy this I think book it's important, on its merits. Like to think about somebody in 1981 
to have this kind of female character that, again, is insanely successful, that is kind, that learns from mistakes, that she's very well-rounded. I think, And, and she's also very really realistic because, yeah. yeah, you know what? It is fucking hard to learn how to live your life in a wheelchair. Yes. It is very fucking difficult. You yeah. know, and, uh, and and this is only, it, it's only, I forget exactly when, I mean, I listened to this great 99% Invisible about the early Berkeley activists yeah. for disability rights, and that they were literally under cover of darkness putting in curb cuts. Yeah. And this was, uh, what, like 10 years before that? It's, Maybe it's 15 crazy. years before like, that? I mean, so, I don't know, like, reading this book, especially off the tail end of some of the other ones that we've read, it was just so nice to see and to remember, like, Again, everybody's grandma, I think, is a little bit of a, like, a pocket feminist. Yeah. And, you know, this is a way of reading. It's a little bit of, like, subversive, like, being subversive and being like, I'm going to read this shit and it's going to be a life that I don't have right now, but I would like to have. Because, like, again, yeah. they're always, like, in a Danielle Steele book. They're it's always highly aspirational. They're always crazy wealthy they always have beautiful things and we want to talk about gendered spaces which kind of like okay so this is so fascinating because she had always writing very very clearly like uh, you can you can visualize very adeptly what these spaces mm -hmm. look like and the spaces are highly gendered in this book um so <laughs> i thought it was very funny that of course her original husband was a sack of shit but yeah. when they talked about what the apartment looks like like he's not in that apartment at all mm -hmm. there's nothing of his in the apartment it's all lace and ruffles and oh it's like Louis Katzhofer's furniture and it's like you know it's very always very tasteful <laughs> very tasteful I mean you can imagine it it's very roughly it's Louis all these the 14th, spaces like, are it's extremely always, feminine like, yeah. um, and then of course she goes to the ranch she, she bought it Sotheby's you know yeah. like of course she did. And then the ranch is the same thing. It's got a couple touches of Caroline's past as this um, this film star. Yeah, this and it's a little bit of like, you know, yeah, yeah, like really like old Hollywood glamour. It's got a bit of Western flair, but like everything's very ruffled. And even like the cabin, it's like the a melding of the styles of the yes. man and the woman. It's all, this interior space is like very specifically drawn and of course all mm -hmm. of her clothes are and everything else too spaces are very interesting though because like when she goes to the men's space she knows she is a visitor there yeah so the man's face is also very clearly de like de described but she knows she's not one of those bitches who thinks she can just walk in and shit like serena does all the fucking time like no she's yeah, like i'm a guest here i need to behave like a guest but it is interesting like Danielle Steele, and I think Jackie Collins does this too, like where she'll use brands. Like you don't get a lot of brands and a lot of those other Celine boots are mine. You know, I will the, have them. The Celine boots, and then like talks about the Hermes scarf. You know, like, and I think she again she picks out things that are deliberately really well known. Like she talks about Louis Vuitton luggage, like things that people know that are super aspirational things to have. But she's obviously trying to talk about enduring style. Yeah. She's not talking about fashion. She's talking about the kind yeah. of things that actual rich people do. Because which is like, where you buy your bag and you keep it for 40 years. You it's know? always about like Samantha is in a white shirt and jeans and her Celine boots. Yeah, you know, and it's the best. even when she's like layering and laying her and layering yeah. because she's working on the ranch, she's still got a certain style to her. Yeah, but it's that kind of aspirational style, like as in we're not aspiring to what the Kardashians but the, yeah, are but doing. The, but the great we're thing aspiring is like, to what like Lauren Hutton is doing. But okay? she's also like super about her femininity, and like she goes and buys like some crazy colored. Cowboy boots. Like teal cowboy boots. Like teal cowboy boots. That oh, yeah. Tate is yeah. like, I hate your boots. And you she's can like, have ha, ha, ha. you can have it all. Guess what? Yes. You can have it was it all really like, still book. Yes. It's it's really kind of heartwarming to see. But it is absolutely about style at any age and style yeah. at yeah, it, it, it's about in Oh, I just find it so interesting because it's very deeply about, yeah. and they don't say this in this, it's about class. And they do say it, though, because that's yeah. what it's about because, like, he's all, like, what? Oh, I should... Well, he should have fucking known about her Celine boots. She think He thinks that he's, like, well, whatever. Well, the other thing that I looked up because I was curious, rich. there's a part where um, Tate is like, I make this much a year. And I was like, let me see how much that is, you know. It was, like, what, like... I looked at, like, what he says, like, I, again, What did he say? It was 18000 18000 and so that would be about 50 
today. Well, wait, let's record scratch because I know what my mother made when she went on maternity leave in 1979 and she's still on maternity leave and I'm 38 years old. <laughs> she made as a teacher with a master's plus 30 in South Carolina and she had 16 years of experience. Do you want to know how much money she made? Go for it. Eleven thousand dollars. Yeah, I mean that makes okay. So when he describes his ex- no, granted he's got like a twenty four seven job. But here's the thing, like when he was like, I make eighteen eight. I was like, what? I looked it up. I was like, well, shit, he makes like over fifty grand. I was like, it's nothing to sneeze at, Bo. Like you're fine. But but she's got she comes in and 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 okay, so it, it does support this code of the ranch thing mm. because the space go to the ranch, go to the ranch, go to the ranch. The, the spaces the men don't go into are so female coded. Yes. it's fascinating. Like it's, it's I don't know if Danielle still knew exactly what she was doing with that or not. I don't want to say that she, think, she was yeah, doing. If you've but, seen her again, if you've seen her fucking desk, oh my God. which you should have seen by now because we keep talking about yes. it. If not, pause. Okay, you remember when I was talking about, like, this is, like, the, the simple Lauren Hutton thing? This she is not that. She knows <laughs> exactly what she's talking about. <laughs> so, but so spaces are clearly coded mm-hmm. in this book, and it's very interesting. I'm sorry. Go forward. <laughs> okay, so, it's question time. No, it's not, because I have more oh, things to oh, say. Oh, okay. <laughs> also, gendered spaces, like, notwithstanding, that men are the mysterious sex in this. They are a little bit, yeah. Yeah, she goes in there and she's like, oh, the men are doing their mysterious things in their mysterious ways. Oh, their mysterious code. Go to the ranch. Like, Go to the ranch! <laughs> like, that the men are this completely inscrutable gender that you will never get. Yeah. Like, and, you know, it's very backwards from, like, like we usually think of this, like, concept of the women as, like, oh, who knows what women are thinking? Like, no, we know what women are thinking, but the men have no yeah, clue. No. Do you... Want to talk about Ryan's with schmichility on this? We talked about it, but you don't have to. We can we can delete this. So I do think interesting in this book there is there is talk about infertility, and for the people who know me, which is some of you, you know, not all of you, I've I lost my son at basically full term. Uh, to a court accident, and am currently going through a little bit of infertility issues. So, this book for me kind of, it didn't hit as close to home as I thought it would. Like, I mean, it is close hitting, and she does, like, for someone who writes this, who probably has never dealt with this, and you can tell she's never dealt with it, like, through some of the writing that she does, it's it, it's good and then like I, and again I can imagine in 1981 where this isn't really a thing that's talked about. Well, and they use the word sterile constantly. They use the word sterile a lot. And one of the things that I did enjoy about st- about Tate was that he told her to stop calling herself sterile, and I liked that. I thought that was nice. I mean, I've never you know thought of myself as sterile, you know. Baron. <laughs> like the winds blow. Yeah, I mean, but but here's and the, the dust whistles. Here's the thing: is like no matter what people tell you about your body, like like oh, you're not your body. Like that's great for you to say, able-bodied person. Like you're still sort of like fuck you, body. So I did appreciate that, and I do appreciate somebody touching on this topic, especially again in 1981. I do think like the one thing that is a little bit kind of ham-fisted about it is like here's this super easy adoption that happens like you know kind of like this everything works out it's fine crackhead mom dies but I do appreciate someone talking about it I do appreciate someone discussing it and I can imagine going through this in 1981 where there's probably a whole lot less options for you though by far and how horrible it has to be and how alienating. So, good on you, Danielle Steele. So. I mean, coming off of a lot of books where people's defining um, characteristics were, were they a virgin or not? Yeah. The fact that, like, to her it was super important is that she was infertile is, like, like a, a thousand steps forward. Yeah, I mean, it really you is. Know? And, again, I do appreciate. Here's the thing. Here's the thing. Like, if you are a woman who has lost her child... Where you are usually relegated to be is at the beginning of a horror novel or a horror movie. Like, that's where we're always put. We're always put in a movie where (laughs) you and your husband, who you're ostracized from, move to another town 
Just to get a fresh perspective. That's where they put us. Because I guess they got money, right? No, but but here's the thing. Like, that's where we're put. We're put into the category of already the most horrible, inconceivable thing has happened. So we're going to put you at the beginning of this thing where other horrible, inconceivable things happen. Like, that's where you see women who have child loss in, like, popular culture or literature is we're always in a horror story. (laughs) So, this was nice to see. It was a little bit refreshing. Like, hey, you know, there's not a haunted doll coming after me. So, (laughs) you know, always appreciate that. So, if you are worried about reading this, if you um, have experienced pregnancy loss or infant loss, or if you have experienced infertility, I'll tell you that while it is a big part of her identity, they talk about it a lot, there is not, no. she does not have a miscarriage, she does not have a stillbirth, there's, there's not a like yeah. a visceral thing that happens during the book. She knows from the beginning, like it happened yeah. before the book starts, that, that she knows that she's infertile. So if that's like an issue that you would choose to read the book or not read the book, based on, that's your information that you need. Thank you, Courtney, for for being willing to talk about that. Sharing my story. Okay, let's talk about our questions. Yeah, I feel like now a horror a horror story is going to talk. <laughs> I know. Story, like someone's going to go through this window because it's very dark outside. <laughs> because I've already talked happen. about it. Like again, that's that's our. And you're going to live, and I'm not because you already said something like you know personal, and <laughs> and I'm just like this horror over here. But anyway, if anybody else can you know glean anything from. You and know. if you would like to talk about um, your feelings about this book and infertility, please do let us know. We don't uh, tell us if you want us to say anything about it or not. We would be really interested to see what your feelings were about this. Yeah. Okay, so it's question time. Yeah. Question time. All right. So, question number one: bastard to bay ratio. Okay. See, this is the guy that I might have been thinking about when we said this because he's he seems like a dick at the beginning because he's just like worried about his management. I'm not worried about management. What? Okay. He's okay. so hot. Oh my god. He's I would super do hot. So he's super hot. And I would do. I him would too. rope him. I would ride him. But he does ghost her. Well, yeah, but the plot made him do that. Uh, and also, he's got problems, and it's the code of the ranch. And go to the ranch. I. I'm gonna give him. I forgive yeah. him. All right. So on our like hotness dude level scale, from he's a got, one to like, ten, problems. He's like from a one to ten. What, where are you putting him? Uh, hotness dude levels. Oh well, he is uh, among what we have read this yeah. entire time. He is the hottest dude who is not uh, Amit from the cute little. <laughs> See, it's not fair to put a contemporary book mm-hmm. in with these vintage books. Okay. So among vintage books, he is my ten. He's your 10. He's okay. super hot. I'm going to put him in a 7 because I'm really pissed about him ghosting her. But you want to leave room too, don't you? I do like to leave room. <laughs> I mean, Grey Eagle still, even though Grey Eagle was He was really hot, though. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Grey Eagle was really hot. Okay. All right. So, not quite a bastard. I mean, again, ghosting a bitch, not cool. All right. So, question 1.5. Bestel to bitch ratio. Oh my god, there were so many friendships in this. Yeah, this is not book, just women friends, but men friends. This book has so many good non relationship discussions. Like again, oh. my like, like friends. If, if, if I'm gonna do friends. like my boyfriend from this book, who is Charlie, Charlie's getting a ten. But you also get Caroline, who is like a yeah. surrogate mom, and they had their own completely different relationship. But like, yeah, but Charlie, like to me, like to me, y'all. Oh. Tate, I could have get like Tate is like a byproduct to me. The hero of this book was Charlie because he's the person that is there for her emotionally the entire time. Also, like honorable mention, Charlie's wife because she never yes. complains. He, he no. spends like a month at the hospital. Okay, he spends a month and she's like, and hey, she's got a baby, like a she's little like, hey, tiny baby. Come home and like he comes home and when he does, it's like he's so happy to see her. I love Charlie because to me Charlie really is the hero. There's of this no book. competition. Like, he's not it's, fucking a person, oh but God. like he is the emotional hero of this book. Like, and he, he gets is, the job, by the way. Yeah, he gets he, he gets the uh, career director job. So and he's an art director of a uh, um, Madison Avenue uh, advertising oh, firm, and he's a straight dude. So Charlie. So this is a fantasy. Give me Charlie. Okay. <laughs> okay. So question number two: How racist is it? Zero except. Well, there's no white, or there's no people of color in this book. Well, okay, that, that's the issue. Hey, okay. The way that, I don't know about in 1981, the way that horses work these days is that people of Hispanic heritage run the horse world, the hard parts. They're yes. the people who are up at 4 o'clock in the morning. Um, the book, everybody is white in the book, except for it does mention, quote unquote, the Mexicans will clean that up. 
the 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 people yeah. who clean the house up who are paid like you know they are like you know maids and all they they do get there's one name it's Mary Louisa I think I don't even remember this but I yeah. remember that because I was looking for it okay yeah. I was looking for it but the fact is it is strange there's yeah, a ranch full of nothing but white people there's no people of color whatsoever among the ranch hands. I think, yeah, so I mean, I understand that that is completely bullshit compared to we read Savage Ecstasy. I'm just pointing it out. <laughs> I don't want to right. like call, draw oh, a false equivalent. No. I'm just oh, no. saying, like, why are these people all white? Okay. Would you mind if someone slapped the heroin? She could handle that shit herself. Oh my god, if someone slapped her, she would like just right over him with a yeah. like, really irresponsible. I force. loved her so much, y'all, and I loved her because I like again. I don't like. And it's something you still see today. I don't like where a woman can only be a thing. Where she can only be pretty. Or she can only be smart. Or she can only be funny. And so I enjoyed that Samantha, a.k.a. Palomino. And we never just oh my god, she's yes. called Palomino because All of her time. hair and because of her We tan. haven't had one of those in a long time where somebody in a book has a stupid nickname. She's I'm the Peacock. You know, he called her little Peacock. You know. Yeah, like everybody she's says Palomino. Great, like, like that's literally what everybody like, calls it her. Wasn't, she wasn't too saccharine about anything. She had some bite to her. I loved her so much. So yes. yes I'd be very upset if someone slapped so her. So she, she could work with her body and she could work with her mind? I mean, I love oh, her. She, she was great. Yeah, I did. And it's like, I love her. I, I get sick of it being like... I don't know, where like, in all these books that we read where the pretty girls are just too stupid to be existing. There's not like, even, yeah. like, an opposite coloring yeah. girl. Like, yeah. a girl who's a brunette, who's, yeah, you know. who's the enemy. Yeah. yeah. Fuck that shit. No, this is legit. Y'all should read this book. Next. Okay. Would your 12-year-old self have dog-eared anything? Yes. Yeah. Now, I, this is a vague book where, you know. You don't see slot A and tab yes, B. Like, but I know for sure that I, I would like to apologize to the library for which, by the way, I now am a reader's advisory librarian. Because I might have gotten this book from them <laughs> and i know that i dog eared some so pages, many pages. because it when you are like fun. 10 yeah. okay like it seems like real sex now i'm like oh come on fucker like with your dick yeah, like where is the dick yeah where's the dick at <laughs> the dick is very it's like on the good place where like uh oh yeah yeah it's like yeah. wind chimes <laughs> but, um okay so yeah i would have dog eared some pages too it's very hot like yeah. there are sex scenes and it's emotional and it's like super vague but yeah I love it. yeah it's good okay what is the CW authenticity for this book? I feel like she did some work on some ranches. She did so much work. Like, I do feel like, and I think this is just Danielle Steele. I feel like, Danielle, like it was kind of like P- Pretty Little Liars comes to the ranch. And yeah. That's like the ultimate endorsement, if you know me, because <laughs> I love the PLLs. Like, I was here for it. Like, how she just had all this money to put the ranch together it was amazing but Anyways, certainly where it comes it's just, it's to the disability pe- part it's yeah. rich people nonsense where they just can do a thing no they did talk about funding the ranch she did yeah she did talk about she talked about like learning about grants i mean she yeah, talked about like yeah. uh, getting rid of all the equipment they didn't need but so, yes i would watch this show too called like horse and a ram i don't know It'll yeah be, Aww. Aww. okay and the little kids who love like oh, oh my god cow. it would be so cute okay uh, so, our last question. No, well, what, what happened to the grandma thing? Was, right, used would to you that. judge your grandmother for reading this book? No, this book is amazing. Yes, this book is really good. No, we got to read message from Nam soon. Because... Oh, my God. Yeah, I remember that one. I think my grandmother had that one. <laughs> okay. And then what kind of booze is this book? I would say that it is a Pedrillo's Malbec because it's got ponies on it and stuff. That's a good one. Yeah, it's cute, right? I'm also going to go with, what, they don't really drink anything in the book. Yeah, I mean, they don't make any, well, God, two beers killed a dude, so. Yeah, um, yeah I might Look go with, like. fucking lightweight. You have to be to drive into a I might go with, beers. like, Budweiser, because it's the great American beer, you know. Illinois. That's probably what they drink in those masculine spaces we barely see in this. Yes, those secret exactly. places. They have secret spaces, y'all. It's really good. So, Okay. <laughs> yeah, can't even talk. But no, I really enjoyed Palomino, and Palomino was Sarah's remembrance book. Mine I'm is so glad that it, it stood up, y'all. <laughs> mine is a whole fucked up hot ball. I'm so excited of nonsense. I'm gonna enjoy it so. So much. everybody just kind of 
scourge your loins, steal yourself. I heard that it's scourge your loins, which I think this is about, isn't it? Oh my god, there's so much gird loin in. Like loin scourging. Girding, like, scourging. Like, I don't know. Like you, you I'm gonna apologize <laughs> to all of you now because my book that I remember from my youth is Silver Angel by Joanna Lindsay. My body is ready. And it is a chic. It's a chic romance. But he's not, though. Isn't he, like, from not... Oh, he's not fucking, he's, lazy puns. He's white, but oh, he's God, a chic. So... Oh, it's not even... There's, okay. there's slavery involved. It's... I'm sorry. But get ready. We'll put the warnings for everything. Like, it's oh, going to yeah. be the world's longest warning for that Oh, book. more than Cat to Fashions? Because no, that was a bit. That was a thing. Again, it's going to be the worst. But oh, anyway, Lord. hope you enjoyed. And thank you for listening. Again, you can find us at BodiceTipplers.com, Bodice Tipplers on Twitter, and Bodice Tipplers on Facebook and, and Instagram. Bodice Tipplers at gmail.com. Yes. Exactly like you would think it is. Let us know. Tell us what you liked as a kid, what you hated as a kid, what made you really confused in your girl parts as a kid. Man. Well, you're more parts. Um, right. We have, by the way, noticed that a lot of you are middle-aged gay men. We love you. Oh, my God. Yes, you're the best. Tell us what you've been reading. Yeah, and so. what you think about that. Um, so we will see you again at Silver Angel. Silver oh Angel. Oh, my God. Peace out, y'all.